comments in here. So, so this issue of how to bring models together with data, um, how to align a model, a ground a model, uh, leverage our assumptions in the model with data, um, uh, is, a, is, is not a cookie cutter one. It, it actually has quite a bit of texture to it. But there's a lot of specific structure to it that, um, that means it, it tends to occur in one of about three different ways, okay? Um, uh, through one of three different mechanisms of bringing these two together, models and data, okay? Um, so uh, one mechanism that's the most familiar and in, in kind of in the, in the lay uh, understanding is kind of what they often will think about um, for non-modelers is they think of a model as kind of having input that are data and putting out data. You know, they, they maybe think of it as a spreadsheet, you know, you plug in some data here and data pops out over there. Now, now it turns out that really in, in many ways does a disservice to modeling because um, modeling has something profoundly different um, in the sense they of all this emergent behavior coming out of the modeling that, um, that provides other opportunities for grounding with data. But I'll come to that in a moment. Parameterization is the most familiar one. And there, you know, we'd be sticking into the model, um, uh, you know, assumptions about, um, about you know, um, the relationship of factors in the model. And um, we saw, you know, briefly when I was talking about exogenous factors, we saw some here, right? Um, like, um, uh, how long does it take for people to adjust their physical activity um, according to kind of prevalent norms that they observe around them or, or um, um, you know, how much, um, uh, how much does the physical activity of people around an individual end up affecting their, um, their, their own physical activity kind of uh, uh, propensity or commitments to, to physical activity. Um, uh, you know, whether or not we impose certain types of socioeconomic, and, and this would be very particular socioeconomic uh, status, uh, sort of relationships here. Um, uh, these end up, you know, encoding a lot of particulars. And, and in fact, if you were to look at the characteristics of the population here, um, uh, you know, there's, there's further assumptions here. Uh, for example, about the initial status of the population, um, you know, the, the sex distribution in the population, the, the characteristics of, of, of the socioeconomic divide, uh, birth weight distribution, et cetera. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, the, uh, the model has assumptions that are encoded, that there are some, there are some assumptions in this model um, uh, which, are, uh, which are encoded numerically, okay? And, um, uh, and sorry, I, I changed something there. I shouldn't have changed. Um, and so um, those are the source often of, of where data comes into the model. We plug in assumptions about the model with that data. And some of them will typically be um, points of, of, of great uh, interest empirically. Um, you know, for example, this probability density, this hazard rate of going from normal weight to overweight has all these beta coefficients. And, you know, um, uh, this beta coefficient would say, how much does each successive age essentially change their risk of, you know, year of age change their risk of, of going from, from normal weight to overweight. Um, and this is very closely related to odds ratios or, or hazard rate ratios as deduced in epidemiological studies. 
or how much is birth weight of, you know, in grams for this particular person. And once we control for other factors end up affecting their risk of transition per year or them being obese or overweight. These are exactly the sort of things that you can work to elicit from biostatistical analyses, controlled biostatistical analyses using um, you know, study data um, from the population. So, so these betas will often be drawn from empirical data. And, and again, that's kind of the input to the model, these exogenous assumptions. We parameterize the model with these assumptions for you know, those, those factors. And often there's quite a bit of data that we can draw on for that purpose. Um, and I'll probably have a lecture about you know, where you draw the, those data from. Um, uh, okay, so that's one type, one way of, of interfacing models with data. A second way of interfacing models with data is a process called calibration. And, and this doesn't really have an analog for what you do with a spreadsheet, nor does it have an analog for what you do with a decision tree for that matter. Um, you here are taking advantage of the fact that when you have a, a model, a dynamic model, it generally gives rise to behavior that is emergent behavior. It's, it's behavior that you didn't plug in there. It's a result of all these other assumptions about that are involved in the structure of the model, how things are connected, how they're related to one another. That gives rise, that induces behavior at a higher level. We saw that with the game of life, right? We had very, very simple rules, but it gave rise to these high level patterns. Um, it would have seen it with, you know, this uh, uh, gestational diabetes model and, or, or a smoking model, et cetera. We give rise to these patterns at, at a higher level. Um, these, this, uh, uh, this GIS food environment. Um, some of you will have have seen this, but you know, if we run this, it involves uh, people in a landscape surrounded by, you know, uh, different types of food environments and and seeking out food and making decisions. Oh, it's actually not this version, but this induces some some um, some changes over time. There's actually another version of this which ends up, um, uh, ends up basically inducing higher level patterns that are, um, that are shown um, associationally. So I'll, I'll, I'll just depict that here. Um, and apologies uh, that this one isn't quite as pretty, but um, if we were to, to you know, um, examine this, uh, this model, it induces the behavior of individuals in this model, their weights and their interactions with their food environment and the availability of parks and their propensity for eating convenience store meals if they're to be obtained by a close by convenience store compared to a further, uh, a further uh, grocery store. It induces patterns you know, with respect to certain types of data. So fraction of meals eaten at convenience stores versus, for example, weight in kilograms or distance to a grocery store versus weight in kilograms or, you know, the ratio of the distance from the nearest grocery store to the nearest convenience store uh, compared to their weight in kilograms. And what you notice is kind of emergent behavior across all of these. Um, and, you know, that uh, those patterns will be you know, even more pronounced if, if we were to have a larger population. And when I say we have emergent behavior coming out of the model, um, I'm talking about patterns like this, which emerge up from the model. They're not pre-programmed in. They're not reducible to any one piece we put in there, any one parameter assumption, any one length, but they are affected by the whole set. And when we have patterns like that, we, we generally work to compare them with patterns in the world that are comparable to them. So we have the model output this data, which, um, which is uh, observed from the model. And we compare it against 
corresponding data from the world. Um, and by so doing, we um, may find that it's totally out of whack, or we may find that it's, it captures some features, some trends from the world, but not the exact values, or, you know, um, it's, um, it, it, it's uh, for early on, it looks reasonable, but after that, it doesn't. In other words, we, we have output from the model that we compare with data from the world. And this is really important because there's a lot of data from the world. There's a great preponderance of data from the world, typically, that can't be plugged in directly to the model, um, uh, but rather as parameter values. It's not about any one parameter. You take the number of cases for COVID-19 in the world so for a given week, that's not, that can't be plugged in for the contact rate. It can't be plugged in for the risk of transmission per contact. It can't be plugged in for, you know, for the recovery time. It can't be plugged in for the, the latency period. Rather, it's a result of all of those at some level and, and many other factors too. But what we want is we want our model to generate data that is consistent with, aligns with, you know, data from the world, corresponding data from the world. So we look at data generated by the model and we try to, you know, evaluate how does this match up with corresponding data from the world. Um, and it is often through this process um, that we further challenge the model and sometimes inform the model. Um, uh, so often it will lead us to rethink parts of the model, but in many cases, what we try to do is we try to adjust model assumptions in the form of less known parameters to best match this data. So we adjust our assumptions in the model so that it best aligns the model output best matches what we actually see from the world in point of fact. And that will often tell you, um, you know, clue you in to plausible values of parameters um, uh, well beyond what you can parameterize in, what you can directly plug in. What you can directly plug in may be quite a bit, but what you can get out of calibration can often you know, inform as much. Um, and particularly where you have many types of calibrated of data to observe from the world. So the fact is a great deal of our data about the world is not about any one parameter. It's not about any one piece of information. It's, it's a result of the messy interaction of all these features. And so that's the sort of data we compare with emergent outcomes from the world these sort of data that bubble up from the model as kind of unexpected outputs from the world or outputs we can't you know, pre-anticipate exactly. Um, and so we make use of a lot of data from the world that way. The final way in which we, we make use of data from the world is one that Maurice will be familiar with, but uh, you know, I, it's, it's a sophisticated idea, so I won't go into it in detail, but it basically involves, um, uh, over time, taking data from the world um, and, uh, and updating our understanding of what's going on in the world uh, as represented by the model to kind of correct for the model's um, uncertainties. And and to kind of reground the model's assumptions about the world. So here, the model has some uncertainties about how the world evolves because of stochastics. And it's always reclued in to what the situation is in the world in a way that allows it to become more savvy, to learn from observations from the world. And often that involves learning about parameter values as well. Um, but it involves learning about the state of the model, correcting the model's misplaced confidence in certain things being the case or what have you. Those are three different ways of, of sort of models interfacing with data from the world.
the first type parameterization gets the most press or gets the most attention from people who've never encountered model before because they they're not aware of the second and third type. But the, in my in my view, in the contemporary context, the second and third type calibration and kind of this correction over time of model dynamics by observations from the world are at least as important. I hope those comments are, are helpful, um, but we will have you know, lectures on uh, at least two of the three, the first two, possibly we'll talk about the third a little bit. Um, although performing the third type for age-based models is still very much in the research sphere. Hopefully those comments are helpful though. Glad to answer more questions about them. <laughs>